it's not been it's not having a twisted mind but it's being careful and responsible for whoever you're taking care of your kids um, whoever you're responsible for so today we're gonna start uh, when the first sign of Jan uh, after the disappearance I should say or the second disappearance Jan calls the family home and Marianne, uh, Karen, the sister, picks up the phone. It's, it ended up being something like a family, maybe over the speaker or some, you know, something that they were all listening to Jan and they were all telling her how much they were missing her and everything. And then they ask her where she is. She doesn't say where she is, but uh, she tells them that uh, she misses them a lot, but she's not going back home. At that moment, Marianne uh, can hear that Bob is coming, her husband and Jan's dad, and ask her to hold on for a little bit longer, so everyone had a chance to talk to Jan. Now, 102 days after her Jan's second disappearance, they still had the FBI had surveillance on Robert. Remember that he was living in a campground RV park kind of thing where he was living out of his motorhome. So uh, on that day, 102, they noticed that he goes to a payphone across the street in the gas station. Now he spent 12 minutes on the phone and then he leaves, but when the uh, the agent goes and check inside the phone booth, they can see the phone book open with a number marked, and it was from Pasadena, California, and it was a girls only Catholic school. Now, for those of you who were not around <laughs> at the time of pay phones, there was a little cabin like looking I don't know how to call it maybe to the size of a um, those chemical bathrooms something like that it had a glass all around it you would go in put a few coins and it will give you a certain amount of minutes and you will, would have a phone book because if you didn't know the phone number that most people didn't know because they had no cell phones so unless they had some kind of a sure that the nun 
friends wouldn't give any information away about Jan because she was probably in danger. So by keeping her secretly in the convent, then that would help her stay alive. Or at least that's the story that he told. The nuns, the FBI, went to the school. second episode. 
episode, I mentioned that Joe said that he was abusing her when she was six years old and he was 12, okay? Just keep that in mind because right now he's painting a sobbing, sad, I need a violin kind of story. But according to him and according to what he told the psychiatrist, he was the one taking care of this little girl. And what he did that, apparently he he felt like he was considered part of the family. The stepdad would, would acknowledge him as part of the family because of the help that he was giving with his younger sister. Now, according to the psychiatrist, later on in life, he wasn't doing good. He was in a place where he didn't feel accepted. So he decided to find that little girl that he had when he was a little boy. And he found it in Jan. So he obsessed over Jan, according to the psychiatrist, or the information that he gave to the psychiatrist because of the sister. Now, you have to understand that uh, psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists, um, they can tell when you're lying sometimes. But you also have to understand that they deal with the most craziest psychopaths and, you know, serial killer if they work with the courts. And um, just so you have an idea, they try to understand why. He did what he did. But a lot of the theories that they come up with is whatever the people open up to them to tell them, you know, I, I, I had a little sister and I was taking care of her and blah, 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 blah. I'm sure that he left out the part where he was abusing his little sister too. With this problem, I have to do something with that he was abused, maybe. Know a lot of people that have been abused today and never even crossed their mind to do something like this, you know what I mean? So, for those people that were criticizing the psychiatrist and everything, um, just so you know, he manipulated the Probergs for years, he managed to have a relationship with Bob, with Marianne, an encounter with Bob in a sick relationship with Jan all at the same time well everyone was loving him so uh, he was a manipulator and he not only manipulated this naive family but just so you get a better idea he managed to do that to the psychiatrist somebody who was trained to uh, deal with this kind of person and was trained not to believe everything that a criminal would say, but tried to use it in a way to help him. So, yeah, maybe the probers were naive, but this right here is just showing you and showing me that he was able to fool even the most, um, somebody that is most educated in trying spot a liar or a psychopath I don't know how he did it I honestly don't know but uh, this is proof that this guy for whatever reason could uh, manipulate people into believing everything that he was saying now in June of 1978 um, months later after she came back she was about to turn 16 years old Jan, um, and she noticed that she, she'll keep in touch with Robert, but she noticed that he, he little by little started to lose that thing with her. He just really wasn't that interested in her anymore. So that summer, Jan decides to go to a camp. This is a five-week-long camp. should let her go, but this was something that she always wanted to do. Uh, she wanted to act, and she knew that uh, this was part of the church thing. This was at BIU, BYU, here in Utah, and that's Brigham Young University, and it's in the Provo area. They had this five-week camp, drama camp, and they decided 
was for him to stay away from her and to understand that he ruined her, her life. At that point, he apologized in court and she actually did end up getting that restriction order against Robert. Now, that didn't stop him anyways, because in one of the events um, that I think she was doing, I think it was in Utah, but I'm not sure, where Jen was speaking, and this was later on when she was a grown woman, and she was giving conferences, and talking to college students, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it was in Dixie University here in Utah, and uh, she was there, and all of a sudden, well, Robert shows up, and uh, they were this, uh, you know, the Bikers Association, Baca Association, I think it's Bikers Against Child Abuse. <laughs> I have a neighbor. They, they you know, they, they have big uh, bikes and motorcycles, Harley Davidson, and, you know, they, they have this association, and they support everything that it's done, you know, this kind of conferences and everything, so there were a bunch of bikers um, in the front door and one of them spotted Robert in this conference in Dixie, and they knew that he was kind of showing up in this place, so they called to him and okay, there are two different versions, I don't think it really matters, but the result is that uh, Robert uh, ran over one of them and he had a gun, so uh, he was charged with three felonies and two misdemeanors, and he was guilty on both charges. He had to go the next following week to be sentenced, and um, he just told his brother that he couldn't take, take one day more in jail. So he took a bunch of pills and alcohol, and he took his own life. Now something and I don't know if it was mentioned in the documentary, but because of Jen's story and because of what she shared, not only help people to, that were dealing with this or that they need to prevent this, but they also found six other victims and they were Robert's victims. This happened before and he was convicted in just one of them and he did get a year in jail. So that is why he said he didn't to go back to jail because it was not that mental institution that he spent six months and he uh, manipulated his way out of but this was mm, jail you know this was he was going to go to prison again just like he had to when they could prove that one abuse out of six that came out uh, after Jen started to share her story and now Jen also said that she forgave her parents, but um, she even said that she had to forgive Robert so she could move on, and that it, she did it for herself, not for his peace of mind. But um, she also said that the hardest was to see her dad judging himself and not understanding how he couldn't see it back then, how he was so naive was a possibility that he did in fact need to sleep by a little girl. He then realized how stupid that sounded and he just, it was so hard to forgive himself. Um, and completely, I mean, we don't know if he ever did. But we do know that Robert was a manipulator and he, I mean, he tried different ways to manipulate all kinds of people professionals, law enforcement, families, little girls, school kids to give Jan's letter. I mean, can you see a pattern here? I do get it that, you know, the dad wasn't aware. Maybe he didn't protect her. But I also understand how Marianne felt responsible because in the end, she was the one that spotted the family at church. She was the one that introduced the family to her own family. John, uh, Jan, Bob Broberg died on November 5th, 2018. And according to Jen, she's happy that he wasn't around to see the backlash that they got after the documentary was
was released and how he was judged for being a bad parent and the mom for being a bad mom. Marianne, this is Jan's mother today and she works in foster care, which I think is something very noble and something that maybe what happened to her can be used for in the future or for these families that really don't know might be going through something similar but in a different way in a more modern way in a more 2019 kind of way and not the 70s how they did it now a few things before we close this series in the documentary they said that they took I don't know how many days to call the police until Sunday they disappeared Thursday they called Friday the offices were closed so they waited until not 100% accurate, Bob did in fact call the police, but at that point, in a, at that point in time, they were looking for a car that was maybe involved in an accident, so they did call the police, but they were looking for the car, they were looking for accidents or their names in some kind of hospital, because in the beginning they just couldn't believe that he took her. So they didn't report her as being kidnapped or missing, but they actually reported them as, I don't know what happened to them, can you please check and make sure that they were not involved in an accident. So they did call the first night, which for a lot of people that was a, something that drove them crazy that they didn't call the first night. They did, but you have to understand that at that point they believed that this was an honor roll man. Businessman, a, a guy with a good reputation, a man of God in their churches, so they just couldn't believe that that was going. Remember, I explained to you that the FBI, when they first started investigating, said, You call it whatever you want, but if he took your daughter, he kidnapped her. And that was the point where they realized, Hey, maybe he did kidnap her. They really trusted this guy. And so that is why the little confusion and I think that it didn't add anything to the documentary so it was left out but yes they did call that first night that Jen didn't come back now why did he marry Jen or what did he tell Marianne in order to continue their relationship and friendship and after the first kidnap well he told Marianne that it that he took her to Mexico for a trip but then when they tried to come back he needed to be a parent or the husband in order to come back to the States it was something that he just couldn't do it as a friend being, bringing a friend with him so that is why Marianne believed that lie and after he came back to, uh, he came back on the second abduction he st she still took him back and they continued their twisted relationship. Now, four days later, they retracted the affidavit that they signed. They didn't mention that either on the documentary, but it was too late. It was already signed, and it really didn't do much as far as him being tried for kidnapping that we know that he ended up in a mental institution instead of going to jail this affidavit that they signed really did help even when they retracted it four days later and finally something that a lot of people were wondering by the second kidnapping Robert was divorced already Gail already filed for divorce and took her kids somewhere else and nobody knows about them they were try well they they tried to contact them to give their input in this documentary Nobody heard from them ever again. And I can't blame them. I wouldn't want to be known or go on TV and listen to all kinds of twisted things that my dad did to a little girl back then. I am assuming, uh, pretty sure, <laughs> that they're all adults, grown adults, uh, as kids, maybe around Jan's age. So, not everyone has the guts to go on TV and explain this horrible things that their dad did. So to close.
post this series of videos, I guess, what I'm trying to share with you is uh, the possibility of being manipulated by other people. We all think that we're smarter than that. We all think that we can smell a liar miles away. Um, but uh, truth is, if you run into a true manipulator, into a psychopath, they have a way to convince a lot of people. So they're not going to convince you only, but everyone around you. In this case, Robert had the entire church convinced that he was a good man even after kidnapping Jen for the first time. He was a member of the community. He was... I just can't believe. But as you can tell, <laughs> he managed to manipulate everyone around him. And that is a master manipulator. So I understand people not understanding Jan's parents. I completely get it. But I think that this Robert is a one of a kind kind of guy, thankfully. Not for what he did to Jan, because sadly that happens often but uh, because of his ability to trick people into believing every single word that he said I remember watching uh, listening to this podcast that said I don't understand he didn't look like anything as special you don't have to look like anything special to be a attractive to people sometimes We should be listening to that little boy 
is because if you watch the documentary, Bob would say every 30 minutes or every 20 minutes, something was telling me not to do it. But I did it anyways. I thought that it was weird that he needed to sleep by Jan, but I wanted to do it to help him. Because that's what the therapist said. He went to this place because he was abused by it, being a child, but he believed that instead of understanding that he was molesting other girls. But who was going to tell Bob that? Is the church going to be spreading this around? Of course not. So I'm not here to defend anybody. But if you want to find the one and only Responsible. I think he has a name. His name is Robert. But we can't just uh, ignore the fact that the parents let uncertain certain things go. Those were a series of mistakes, and as I mentioned in another video, to me, and I'm giving you my opinion, <laughs> when you do something bad, you do. Eh, nothing happened. I can do it again. Or I can do this. And that little bad decision becomes a series of bad decisions. And the series of bad decisions will lead you to something very evil. You're letting all that negativity, all that evilness get in your house, get in your marriage, get in your family. Excusing, I should say, your behavior, your bad behavior. Now we all make mistakes, and if Bob had that encounter and then, you know, cut Robert out of the family picture, I would have understood. But I guess what it's hard to understand for all of us is how these things kept happening, and we know why. Because he had the ability to make everyone believe his lies. And if you are a manipulator, then uh, uh, it's easy to spot another one. But if you are a naive person, you believe everything that they say. And I'm just talking about personalities. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. Or that everyone is this way. I'm just saying that are two different personalities. And most manipulators will find somebody that they can take advantage of. They're not going to find another manipulator to try to outsmart them. So overall, a very sad story with something good out of it. The awareness that Jen is spreading around. I think it's good. I think that having that documentary done was therapeutic for Bob. Saying it out loud in front of cameras. Yes, I did have an encounter with Rob with Robert. I think it's part of the process of forgiving yourself when you do something horrible. And I think that's what Bob and I guess his entire family was trying to do. And I want to leave you with something that it's maybe a little bit silly, but uh, just so you keep in mind voice inside of you needs to be heard. And I'm talking about important things, okay? We all hear that little voice when we're going to a restaurant and we should get a salad instead of french fries. And we ignore it. That's okay. You can ignore that. But if it's something related to your kids, if it's something related to your husband, to your loved ones, if the consequences will be something that will haunt them for the rest of their lives, please listen to that little voice that is telling you what to do at that moment. Do not wait 20 years to listen to that voice after everything is done. Because then when you make the decision, it will be too late. Trust your God. Trust instinct. Trust 
the Holy Spirit, whatever you believe that you have in you, that can tell the difference between 